to sometimes. But I would say 90% of us have had uh, some personal experience with someone that has a mental illness or is having a really big problem. It's either someone you know, related to us, it's a close friend. Uh, and so hopefully today we're going to discuss you know, some uh, ways to kind of uh, observe that or become more aware of that. Um, but before we go any further, what I'd like to do, I guess, is to introduce our two experts uh, that are here today. And uh, just uh, very exciting because they're not workers' comp attorneys, so please do not hold that against them. <laughs> uh, but uh, we'll start off with Kelly Gregory, uh, who is a licensed mental health counselor and uh, is the founder and owner I am president of uh, Arena Counseling and Wellness. Um, what uh, I found, found very interesting about her background is she started off teaching in public school, grades six through 12, which I think is a badge of honor <laughs> in any, uh, anywhere you would look, um, and certainly prepared her to move on to becoming a therapist at the Phoenix House Addiction Treatment Center. Uh, and then uh, later then fi you know, fi finding her, uh, her, her current spot, which is to be the, you know, the, the person in charge of arena counseling and wellness. Um, her background includes uh, going to uh, and getting her Bachelor of Arts in Communication with a minor in Psychology at Wheaton College. Uh, and then for you Gators, she then went on to become uh, at the University of Florida, a Master's and Specialist degree in Mental Health Counseling. Um, and I understand they have the same school color, so at least That's it was the only reason I was allowed to go. We and also okay. was orange and blue. <laughs> Another uh, fun fact, I guess, about Kelly is that uh, her uncle is Paul Westcott. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Kelly him. Oh, so, that's cool. And I think he gave you some bad advice before or something about... Anyway, oh, but he, we'll get there. We'll get there. I'll throw so, him under the bus later. Exactly. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's just a, a real treat to have her uh, present uh, today. And... Um, and we also have Rebecca Bandy, who is no stranger. She was here last year. Um, she is currently the director of the Florida Bar's Henry Latimer Center for Professionalism. Uh, she joined the center in March of 2017. Uh, prior to joining the Florida Bar, she worked as an associate attorney at the law offices of Thomas L. Powell, uh, where she litigated in the areas of family and criminal law. Um, she has also taught college level courses at Lawton Childs High School where she helped establish the school's award-winning mock trial team. And so two things that uh, our two panelists here share is that they have taught at the high school level, which, you know, again, uh, I think that qualifies them in many different ways to be able to speak today. Um, it's way hard. That's true. Oh, goodness. So, but uh, Rebecca earned her Juris Doctor from the Florida State University College of Law. Uh, for you Seminoles, a native of the tiny town of Hilliard, which is uh, just above Jacksonville, which you know I think very highly of. And then uh, she earned her bachelor's in communications with honors at JU, so a dolphin, and then her teaching credentials at Georgia Southern University. Um, very involved in the community, has done many talks, and uh, I could go on and on, but I think uh, we'd like to probably hear about uh, what we're going to be here today on. So as a roadmap, I think what we'll start off with is we're going to talk about statistics and, uh, you know, what is the science, I guess, behind such a topic that is, it's, it, you can't see it. Uh, lost him. Say what? We lost your volume. You did? Yeah. What did I do? How about that? Is it better? Okay. I'm probably going to pull a few of those today. So <laughs> anyway, but as a roadmap, uh, statistics about the general population of mental health and what's going on. Uh, especially since COVID, uh, and then also in our lawyer population, what, uh, what, what, what it looks like from that standpoint. Um, we're going to discuss about understanding the unique challenges of the legal profession. I think we heard a little bit about that earlier today, um, how it translates uh, to common mental health issues and its impact on professionalism, uh, barriers to seeking help and strategies for enhancing mental health, and then programs and initiatives through the Florida Bar and other ways that uh, we can kind of help address it. So with that being said, what I'd like to do is to turn it over to uh, Kelly. Yay. 
Yeah, hi everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I know I stick out in a sore thumb in this room is how I feel, uh, but very excited and honored to be here. So I'm just going to kick us off with sort of a general overview of statistics about mental health before COVID, throughout COVID, and now that we're sort of moving out into our post-COVID world. The next one. So the general sort of gist, I have a few slides and pictures, but we really saw a spike. I'm going to kind of talk about some of the main ones, loneliness, anxiety, depression, substance use. We really saw a spike during COVID, and things have leveled out to some degree, but they are not back to where things were post-COVID level. Uh, you can see one of the stats on here, that fourth one, that 90% of Americans really believe that we are in the middle of a mental health crisis, and a lot of that has been impacted by COVID. Those first couple stats, uh, depression and anxiety, have increased by about 25% overall since COVID. Substance abuse is up about 23%. And I think the last number is probably low, but 10% of people feel like their mental health needs aren't being met. And again, my guess would be that was low. That will not work if I go next. <laughs> um, let me see here. Okay, so uh, you can see at the bottom, it, we're just noting like before the pandemic, anxiety was about at 16%. It sort of peaked around that 32, 30, 33, or sorry, 39%, and we're back down to 32. So we're still almost twice as high as we were before the pandemic. You can go on to the next one. Similar thing, loneliness was obviously a big thing that we talked about during COVID. Um, and even though it's come down a little bit, we're still looking at about that 17 to 20% are reporting really high levels of loneliness. That, that's one out of five, right? That means one out of five people in this room are feeling pretty lonely or isolated or disconnected. And that has such a huge impact on our mental health. Next. It's just another loneliness graph. Uh, basically the blue line is before and the green line is just showing it's increased and gone up since COVID. Um, these are stats from during COVID, but again, we've seen similar patterns with substance abuse. So some of these have come down a little bit, but they're still much higher than they were prior to COVID. 92% of millennials believe that COVID has a significant impact on their mental health. 40% uh, of us have reported increase in the amount of substances that we use. And just overall, there's been an increase in overdoses and an increase in harder drugs that are being used. So... There's our, our sort of picture of where we're standing and I think why it's so important and grateful that we're talking about this topic today. And I think Rebecca's gonna speak a little bit more specifically about the legal profession. Yes, yeah, so I'm Rebecca Bandy and I am the director of the Henry Latimer uh, Center for Professionalism at the Florida Bar. And I have been at the bar since 2017. And my job is to promote professionalism, which a lot of people are like, oh, you're the arm that gets everyone in trouble. And actually, no, I am not a cap. My job is to keep people out of trouble. So I see myself sort of as a PR agent for the bar in that I go out to our sometimes even high schoolers, undergrads, last week I spoke at Florida State University College of Law to their Women in Law Pre-Law pre Society. Um, law schools, Florida has 12 law schools across the state, and then also our uh, attorneys. There are over 111,000 attorneys in the Florida Bar. Um, and by attorneys, I also mean judges as well. And so um, this is something that I regularly do, going out and giving people the tools to be the best professionals that they can be. Because it's my firm belief, it's like the whole kind of overplayed analogy of the flight attendant. You know, you can't take care of yourself if you can't take care of others. That is so, so true. And while the statistics that Kelly just gave you are grim, the problem with these statistics is that they've been grim in the practice of law for a very, very long time. And so of all the topics that I talk about to all of these groups of people, including just general professionalism, which is why I was here last year moderating a panel, to um, talking about how to become a lawyer, how you know emotional intelligence, communication skills, all of these things that fall underneath my umbrella, the most highly requested topic that I get asked to speak on is stress awareness and prevention and also resilience and mental health and wellness. So all of those sort of in one you know, lump sum, that is my most highly uh, requested area that I'm asked to go out and give educational speeches on. And so I'm passionate about this. Um, back in 2017, there was a study done by the Hazleton Betty Ford Clinic. We, we know the Betty Ford Clinic 
pop culture name, right? So the Hazleton Betty Ford Clinic did a study that came out and it really rocked the legal world because it was the first real comprehensive study on mental health, wellness, and specifically that study focused on substance abuse because of Betty Ford Clinic, right? So looked at the statistics for those issues in the practice of law. Around the same time, there was also a sister study done of law students, tracking them from their 1L year to their 3L year. And what we saw was a huge increase in mental health, wellness, substance abuse issues from the start of 1L to the end of 3L year going into graduation and studying for the bar. Are we surprised? Anybody in here? I don't know about y'all, but I hated law school with a passion. <laughs> don't tell Florida State that. I love, go Knowles, but law school is not my friend, right? And then you go into the bar and then taking the bar exam and then you're practicing law and we have, you know, what is it we have when we start? We, none of us really know what we're doing when we start, right? So we, we all struggle with that. And so we are in a really interesting profession because it is toxic and the statistics show it. So going back to that study, uh, we have some pretty hev heavy data, right? And the striking thing about the Hazleton Betty Ford data is it's all self-reported information. So you know it's low, it's not gonna be real. And what that information showed was the following. So if we can, uh, oh, actually it's on the board already. This is just a screenshot from the Florida Bar's wellness website. So if you go to the Florida Bar's website at www.floridabar.org, there is a mental health and wellness center. These statistics are on there. So primarily from that Hazleton Betty Ford Clinic study, some other studies mixed in, and it will show you the following statistics. Alcohol abuse, we're at about 36%, which is way higher than the average population. Self-reported, uh, men tended to, in these studies, tended to, to score higher. Um, younger attorneys higher in this area, and then also solo practitioners. I do a lot of work with the solo and small firm section. Some of you may have seen some of my CLEs that I've done on wellness because they're so gracious uh, and passionate about giving people tools. Depression, 28%, again, higher for men according to these studies. Again, a risk for solo practitioners. Why? Loneliness, which Kelly hit on and I'll also talk about. Stress, extremely high. Um, higher in women, which is interesting. Um, again, solo practitioners. Anxiety, extremely high. Tends to be higher in women, according to these studies, solo practitioners. Suicide. These are the published statistics by the Florida Bar. We are fourth by profession, or by proportion in profession for suicide risk. We are fourth by proportion uh, in profession of suicide risk. Y'all, these are pre-COVID numbers. These are pre-COVID numbers. So the entire time we were going through COVID, I was sitting back thinking this is a recipe for disaster. Because then there was a study in 2019-ish that was published by a couple of national newspapers and magazines, which showed that being the loneliest profession in America, and it wasn't targeted at lawyers, it was a study of loneliness by a couple of well-known authors and, and people studying happiness and well-being, um, and, and it looked at loneliness, which Kelly hit on. Y'all, we are the loneliest profession in America. That was in 2019-ish. Okay, and you can Google, what is the loneliest profession in America? All these articles will start coming up. I think it was the Washington Post, which published. So we are the loneliest profession in America. Uh, the ABA did a follow-up study on that one and, and or did a, an article to follow up on that study, which, which put that information out. So most people look at that and they're like, oh, that's, that stinks, right? And then they move on. But for me, who's immersed in this data all the time, I immediately knew that that's a big problem because there is a plethora of research going way back on loneliness. Loneliness will kill you, period. It is a higher indicator of early death than excessive smoking, excessive drinking, and obesity. Mm. Wow. It will kill you. So we're the loneliest profession in America. We are higher than normal across the board in terms of these mental health and wellness statistics. And then COVID hit. Boom. So what do we have now, right? That's the problem, and that's what we're looking at today, and why we're so glad that we have Kelly here with us to shed some light on this. I can tell you that we do have two small studies 
that just came out since COVID. There has not been another like comprehensive study that I am aware of, um, you know, similar to the Hazleton Betty Ford data. There was two. There were two studies done in 2023 20, uh, that were smaller. The first one is from American Lawyer Magazine, so ALM. Some of you may get articles from them from some to, time to time, in uh, conjunction with Compass Health. I'm going to read off my paper, which I hate to do, but I want to make sure that I'm accurate here. 71% of the nearly 3,000 attorneys that were surveyed as part of this study said they have anxiety. 71%. This is a 5% increase from the study the year before. So in addition to that, 38% said they dealt with depression. People don't talk about that. So for 38% of this 3,000, you know, some odd attorneys to say they're suffering from depression, that's a red flag for me that this is, we've got some issues. You cannot practice law and help other people if you're not taking care of yourself and you're not well, right? And so knowing is half the battle. If we're all in this boat and we know that we're struggling, we have to have these conversations. We have to be real about it. We have to recognize that our coworkers, these j judges that we deal with, our clients, people are struggling. And we have to talk about it, we have to recognize it, and we have to have systems to support them and to help them. Um, more than 60% of those su surveyed said they were overwhelmed, irritable, exhausted, and unable to concentrate. That is me today, right? <laughs> Which is why I'm reading off this paper, because if y'all have seen me speak before, I usually have the, this data memorized. Um, in addition, the second survey that was done in 2023 was a joint study with the DC Bar and the California Bar. The California Bar has really been on top of this, and this one is entitled, and I'm going to give you the full title of this study, Stressed, Lonely, and Overcommitted. Have your hand. Single mom, teenagers on a job. Lawyers are two times, according to this study, lawyers are two times as likely uh, as a general population to experience suicidal patients and um, lawyers with high stress were found to be 22 times more likely to contemplate suicide those um, stress. So I'm going to quote the head of the calendar. This data shows us that there are a little over 1.3 attorneys in the United States. So that's about 130 to 156,000 people that think about their lives. That is CEO of the CLA California Bar, uh, Mr. Mel, from him. For that person, I have help for you. Please, help. we love to get the Florida Bar about you. The Florida Supreme Court cares about you, or I would not be here today. Do that. Say no. You cannot talk about things, but instead, I'm telling you if somebody you know or you're please reach out. There's so many other statistics in those studies, but I want you to know that we have a profession, quote, unquote, that fosters perfectionism. We know that, but we are also a profession that is passionate about serving our attorneys and making that professionals can be. So let's be that. Let's have this conversation. To know. You know, I, I guess the next section is discussing the uh, the unique challenge of the profession. Uh, and I think all of us know a lot about that. Sometimes I think it's good to be able to talk about it, to voice it, uh, to acknowledge that this is a very uh, gig. You know, it's a very environment. I had never thought it was toxic, but it probably it is. Toxic. I mean. Point, but uh, you know, you know, the, the the thing that got to my mind about what our profession is like is when I was talking to a contractor about uh, fixing up his home, and I promise it's related. So, <laughs> a very honest, be too honest, but you know, that there is this thing called the law of business, and you guys have probably heard of our arts majors, but. You can get it done three ways. You can get it fast, you can 
cheap and you can get it well done, but you're not going to get all three. You'll never get all three. You'll get two of the three at best. Likely, you're only going to get one of the three. So if you, if you want something good or fast, cheap. If you want something fast or cheap, it won't be good. And if you want something cheap, fast. So, but the thing about the law is expected to do all three. You know, we don't have the luxury being told, well, you can't get all three. Not only that, but if you provide that service, the day and then the day, they want even more. Expecting so, I think that's just to me that kind of is it just in the head. But talk about you know, low details, actors driven, tight deadline, pressure to win cases, to meet expectations, the pressure to succeed, ethical and dilemmas that we're responsible for dealing. With long working hours, irregular schedules, uh, and there's the average nature of the system where and head to head a lot of times, sometimes with a judge, but that doesn't, but you know, it, it's just, and then finally, the one that I think that I it's the last mission for a job well done. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just expected you go up a good job. People are like, okay, well, that's good, but then what are you going to do tomorrow, right? So, you know, one of the things I try to do on the big side is when uh, both, it has to be both, play favorites. When both of the attorneys do a good job, I will tell them they've done a good job in front of their clients. Now, if you don't say that in front of them, it means the other guy might not have done a good job, the other girl might have done a good job, or maybe it's a bad day. Uh, for the, I really do because nobody else is going to do that, right? You know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of the problem is if you feel like you're doing all this work and nobody cares, nobody appreciates, nobody, uh, it, 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 taking note, it makes it feel just, it's just a tough situation. So where I can, I try to help, and I judge it. We are, we are aware. We watch body language. We see your experience. We see how it goes. You know, for the, for the most part, you know, I can sometimes tell what's going on with an attorney, you know, and, you know, I, I kind of like the Florida, I do care about my appear in front of me. I have a good life to do well. But I love to see when two attorneys are their top and beating it in a professional way, um, you know, but uh, it's something that I do try to have awareness of and, and pay attention to. And if, if it ever comes up, I try to pull somebody just say, hey, is something going on, going on with you? Type of thing. So, that's really all I have for my. So, let's go and question over how do you, how can you, someone's not uh, well, you know? So, um, I'll pick up as you're hitting on. I'm jumping ahead a couple of lines. Sure. Yeah, too. So, I'm kind of hitting all this. Judge Holly already talked about um, a lot of attorneys in the field. I've been meeting with friends who are attorney to me. I really have a good understanding before coming here today. Um, do you mind if I just grab and I'll go through mine? Thank <laughs> exactly. you. Um, so these are kind of things that Judge Holly already hit. Why y'all need therapy? <laughs> <laughs> I tried to take a poll last night of like, what do we think this, this is going to go over? But I think we've set the scene for it. So there's some bias right at this point. So first of all, you most people in this room are really high achievers. Right, that we have expectations, we can have problems. we really keep making mistakes, we create a lot of anxiety and stress. I also wanted to like your egos a little bit. High IQs can also be linked to mental health struggles. I have thought there's a lot of really intelligent people in the room. Um, and also is highly related with uh, we're like, why aren't people doing things better and more differently? Um, you guys have so much critical aspects of clients' lives, like they're hinging on performance. Charlie's touching on the adversarial part of, the, of your all's career. At dinner last night, one of the was just talking about you in the courtroom was the next day, um, and then you guys are at dinner, so you're at a social event. Kind of jumping to the last bullet point. I would imagine as humans, we take diverse to vulnerability. I guess that that's probably even higher in here what you guys are going through. Um, so, 
look at how some of the impacts of stress can affect us. So a little chart here, stress impacts our body. Basically, it kicks in our fight or freeze response. A lot of hormones into our body. Cortisol, which is a stress hormone. This response is really, really awesome. We have to go out hunting for a week, and we have to like, fight a bear, run away from a tiger. You see the little tiger on the top, top of the slide. But today, in our modern world, Tiger can be every time I check my email, every time the phone rings, every time the boss comes into my room. So for many of us in this sort of modern world in where we're not out you know, hunting, our with our tigers. They're in every corner. And a lot of us that put the nervous system in state chronic or constant stress and deregulation. So this can have a lot of immune, blood metabolic disruption, sleep patterns, effects on us physically as well as mentally and emotionally. So I'm hoping to create some buy-in that we all have a lot of stress and that it has impacts um, on our nervous systems. Um, and this idea that we all have mental health. One of my hopes today is to sort of demystify and destigmatize. It's, it's, uh, I know it can be kind of a scary word or something we're not familiar with, but also just trying to put out there the, that we can all operate from a place of we all have moods, we all have emotions, we all have thoughts, and that they're all really important, that the better understanding we have of how our thoughts and emotions work together, the more successful we're going to be at navigating life. In fact, emotional intelligence, or EQ, is one of the highest predictors of success, not just personally, but professionally. It is one of the top indicators of success. So recognizing the importance of mental health, understanding our own, helps us be more successful and also helps us support the people around us. Thank you. Um, so how do these things show up? I sort of intentionally, we have a depression more on the right and uh, anxiety more on the left, but I really wanted you guys to look at these as clusters of how these things can present. I also did a green, yellow, red gradient you can see in the back uh, because I want to invite you guys to I think it can be easy to think of diagnoses like anxiety or depression as sort of this black or white or someone has it, I don't have it. And that's just not how that, this works. We all get sad. We all get stressed. We all get anxious. So as I move through the next couple slides, doing some of that introspection of what does my green look like? What does my yellow look like? And what does my red look like? Because we all have these things. Um, Thank you. Uh, so again, I kind of said we'll talk about the big three. So we had depression and anxiety. Substance use is also one that shows up a lot, and I think probably something you guys notice is showing up in your field as well. This is another great thing that's important to think about on sort of when am I in the green, when am I in, in the yellow, and how would I know if it was beginning to move into the red? A question that we use in therapy all the time is asking clients, like, well, how would you know it was a problem? What's going to indicate to you that I'm in my yellow? And that can be, it doesn't have to be substances. It can be anything. But what are those things that are going to indicate for you that I'm sort of moving into a really burnt out territory? Stress is one of the biggest factors for abusing substances. Um, and when we're stressed, we turn to substances to cope. We use drugs because they work, right? Drugs work. That's we've, If they didn't, we wouldn't have a problem with them. <laughs> um, I also like to, if you're like, man, alcohol's not really my thing, or you know, I'm not on any medications, I also just invite you to think about the idea that we are all addicts in our own right at times, that I think we all have ways of coping or numbing or dissociating or escaping our pain, that maybe it's not substances, maybe it's work. I, you won't point any fingers, right? But I imagine that might fit for a lot of people in here. It's really easy. And it's it's a addiction that's really culturally approved of, right? We really like it in our culture for you to be addicted to work or addicted to the gym. So just sort of thinking through what are what might be the way that shows up for me in my life. Thanks. So science that's something someone is struggling. Going back to what Rebecca was saying about how much the bar and these organizations really care about you guys, I know that was a big intention for today, is how do we notice if someone is struggling? How do I reach out? I also just encourage you, again, to be reflecting for yourself that these are indicators often for ourselves or for others. So binging on entertainment, that can be staying at home and watching Netflix all day, every day, which is absolutely OK once in a while, <laughs> and a huge support of a good Netflix binge. Uh, but is it kind of becoming more and more and more? Or even the person who's staying out all late 
partying, right? Doesn't want to go home. It can show up a lot of different ways. Uh, hygiene concerns, someone looking disheveled. Increased isolation or withdrawal. Now, don't go after our introverts in the room. Uh, <laughs> for a lot of these, you want to look at an increase or a decrease. So what's someone's baseline? Am I noticing changes? Increased messiness. Lack of being present. So someone noticing a shift in someone's mental state. Do they have a really hard time listening to me when I'm talking to them? Are they forgetting information? Do they seem really distracted? Um, a change in expression, are they monotone, are they mumbling, have they lost their sense of humor, are we seeing darker humor, hopelessness, increased negativity, loneliness and hopelessness are two of the biggest indicators for sort of more acute mental health presentations. Increased somatic symptoms, again, think about yourself, a good thing to keep an eye out for others as well, but increased GI issues, headaches, migraines, body aches, tension, fatigue, these are all indicators that we're probably moving into a yellow zone. Uh, and more clumsy, we'll lose bodily awareness, loss of interest in things, um, and obviously the substance use piece. So what are some barriers? Obviously we know that there is a stigma with mental health, I think probably especially high in this field, that's why we're here to talk about it today. I know that there's a fear of professional repercussions and I think that's something that we want to address. Lack of time for self-care, which I think we can all struggle with, and a reluctance to be vulnerable, which again I think is very, very prevalent for the work that you guys do. So I want to speak to a couple of these things from my perspective um, as a clinician. One is documentation, that we are in your corner, and we are on your team, and we are on your side, and we are professionals as well. Um, so we can be very, very sort of careful or intentional with the sort of documentation and note taking that we do, that even worst case scenario, we have done our very best to sort of protect you and your interests and you know as long as we're being ethical but there is an awareness of that and again in all of my time in private practice i've never had my notes subpoenaed but that's a great thing that you can talk to a clinician about if you're interested in mental health ask them about their note taking ask them about the records and things like that the next one is diagnosis i think this is a really valid fear that a lot of us might have of i don't want to go to a therapist i don't want to go to a psychiatrist they're going to slap a diagnosis on me i have to report it to people it's going to follow me forever and to be fair if you see someone in network with your insurance that might be true with an insurance company we have to justify care and insurance wants diagnoses however at my practice or if you're fortunate enough that you can do private pay or out of pocket I really only deal with diagnoses if they are exclusively needed, specifically helpful to the client. So I just want to dispel this myth that if I go to therapy, I'm going to immediately get slapped with some diagnosis and that's going to be terrible. Most of us do free consultation. So if, you, if it's something you're thinking about, please don't be afraid to ask that question. Ask about documentation, ask about diagnoses, and it's something we're really happy to have a conversation with you about. And then again, if we're afraid of these uh, fear of the professional repercussions, let's have preventative care. I have our nice, smiling, happy dentist on here because let's <laughs> treat the cavity because it beca before it becomes a root canal. That before we have the Baker Act or the DUI or the panic attack in front of Judge Hawley, what are we doing <laughs> to make sure we're mitigating some of those concerns? Let's not let it get to the red. Let's. Therapy can help, you know, when we're in the yellow, bring us back down to that green zone. Okay, so this is where I want, it's my lawyer friend actually, he was like, Kelly, you have to use this term. He's like, tell them all subsequent remedial measures and they'll all get it. And then last night they were like, he's a personal injury attorney. No one, had, everyone was like, we don't, we don't know what that is. So this is my failed slide. But I'm going to take you back to law school for a second and teach you all about subsequent remedial measures, which basically I learned, I'm going to read because I just learned it, but that the purpose of this rule is to encourage individuals and organizations to take steps to improve safety without fear that those actions will be used against them in court. So if we're afraid of professional repercussions, we're going to use your old, own language to help dispel that, that we don't want to punish people for trying to make things safer and healthier. So five well-being tips, prioritize yourself. When our check engine light comes on in our car, it's valuable, we wanna take it to the shop. Often when it's ourselves, what do we do? We stick a post-it note over it and we keep on driving. Yes. <laughs> so don't end up broken down on the side of the road, emotionally or physically. Set boundaries, one of the hardest things we can do, but protect your time, protect your energy, learning to say no. Who are my support systems? Who are the people in my life? And 
the second question is, do they deserve to be there, right? Oh, Who are boundaries. the people? Yes, more boundaries. <laughs> Who's in my life? Do they deserve to be there? When I'm in crisis, who am I turning to? And are they helping support me? And take breaks. Number five, therapy doesn't have to be scary. I wanted to give it its own slide. <laughs> Uh, again, we operate from a wellness model. So we're not like, oh, here are my broken down, sick, just fallen apart clients. That's not how we see our clients. We see well people who want to be the best versions of themselves. I like to think of therapy as going to the gym. I don't go to the gym because I'm sick and broken. And I don't go to therapy because I'm sick and broken. I go because I want to be well and I want to be healthy. This idea of looking at it as mental injury rather than mental illness we all go through things in life. We are affected, we are impacted. None of us get through life unscathed. Therapy helps when that bone breaks, it helps make sure that it's gonna reset in the right way. Um, they've done a great job of sort of touching on potentially toxic aspects of the work environment. Uh, so I wanna look at environmental factors as well. Along with the perfectionism, we can often fall into traps of everything's my fault, right? If I'm struggling at work, I must not be doing a good enough job. I'm not working hard enough. And I just want to invite and encourage and remind, we need to be assessing our environments as well. We can't heal in environments that aren't healthy. So what's my workplace like? What's my home like? Is it open? Is it respectful? Do I feel safe there? Is there good communication? So when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. So remembering, again, sometimes we can really blame ourselves to look at the environment as well. So I want to, um, kind of in these last uh, parts of my bit here, really talk to leaders of the field or for those of you who are kind of asking, well, what can we do? I think one of the big ones is what we're doing here today, to talk openly about mental health, to like say the scary words, right? Again, we all have it, thoughts and emotions. So to talk openly, to talk authentically, dare I say to talk vulnerably uh, to one another to reach out, to mentor newer members of the field, to reach out to those who are struggling. And I think one of the biggest things we can do is if you are more advanced in your career, do you feel comfortable talking about your own struggle? Do you feel comfortable talking about your own adversity? That can create such a sense of hope and encouragement. Um, I think imposter syndrome was on one of the earlier slides. So just for people to know, they're not alone, that they might feel like they're drowning and for someone to be able to say, hey, I've been there and here's how I got through it. Um, I own a company, we have about 15 people on staff, and this is one of the most important things to me, is that if I take care of my staff, I want my clients to have the most exceptional care we can possibly provide. And as the owner of a business, what that means to me is it is my responsibility to make sure my staff are well taken care of, that they have a good work-life balance, that they're taking time off. So to the leaders in this room, check on your people, check on your staff, and that's how we have thriving, prosperous clients and companies as well. So I want to demystify a little bit what do we talk about in therapy uh, because I know it can seem abstract if you've never gone. Uh, so are we going to look at the past and the present? What has maybe impacted me? What are my current struggles? What are my thoughts and beliefs? What have I learned? What have I been told? What are the words that people have spoken into me that I might want to let go of, that I might want to put behind me and move forward? What's working for me and what isn't? I say to my clients all the time, you are the expert in the room. I am not coming in here to tell you what's wrong with you. I'm listening, I am learning, and I'm trying to understand, and you get to decide what's working for me and what's not. My emotions, we want to identify them, understand what they're trying to tell us. Our emotions are messengers. They are trying to let us know uh, important information. We look at relationships, our sense of identity, coping strategies, communications, a big one, how to express ourselves assertively and navigate conflict constructively behavioral patterns, and then goals and values. Where do I want to be and how do I get there? So that's um, just some of my spiel on why you guys are so uh, stressed, which is beyond valid. You have so much on your plate. Um, just wanting to sort of break down some of the barriers that we might have around therapy and to sort of explain a little bit how that process looks. There is a handout. I don't know if it's gone around. There should be plenty when we leave. My information is all on there, so I'm really happy to answer any other questions. Uh, but I will go ahead and turn it back over to one of you guys. All right. Let's see. Okay, so uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask Rebecca about, um, you know, uh, Judge Hedler and I were kind of looking through the internet, and um, all of a sudden this popped up, and uh, 
I had forgotten this since law school, but there is a rule to report uh, professional misconduct. And so, uh, but I, what I found interesting though about that is there is a remedial subsequent measure built into yeah. that. Um, but uh, there are, you know, it, it does break it down, you know, how elements are. You have to break things down in elements. So um, the first part is, you know, a lawyer who knows that another lawyer has committed a violation of the rules of professional conduct, that with the condition, raises a substantial question as to that lawyer's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness as a lawyer in other respects must inform the, the professional authority. So then when you were get into the, the comments section, of course, substantial has its own meaning, uh, the seriousness of the possible offense and not the quantum of evidence. And then what I really uh, kind of uh, like to see in this uh, reporting rule is that, you know, if you're in a program that has been approved uh, you know, to get assistance, then obviously, um, you know, any information obtained from that is not something that is supposed to be reported. And, and I think the bar has uh, shown through this last uh, sentence uh, in the comment section, you know, that they do want uh, to address it. They don't want to have it hidden. They don't want it to suddenly pop up and surprise everyone uh, from the standpoint of, you know, getting help is, uh, is really important. So uh, I guess my question to Rebecca is, how does that impact, uh, I mean, what, what's been your experience, I guess, when seeing people reporting this and not reporting it? I mean, how do you think it impacts uh, the ability to, uh, to get people to get treatment, especially so, lawyers? So that's a complex question, and again, I'm not part of ACAP. So for those of you who are not familiar with the bar and how the bar works, which for me, before I worked with the bar, I will candidly tell you I was not um, as a practicing lawyer. But when someone calls to make a bar complaint, whether it's a judge, a lawyer, a member of the public, they call our attorney consumer assistance um, uh, hotline, which is the ACAP hotline, and that's where they make a report, right? We actually have another resource available now so that everyone doesn't have to jump the gun and just make bar reports all the time, uh, which is a good thing. So I don't have, because I don't work in ACAP and I don't have statistics, for example, on the number of calls just on this issue. Um, I can't give you specific statistics and I'm, I'm sorry for that. I can tell you that this is not something that gets reported a lot. So when they pull my data, when I say to the ACAP department lawyer regulation, hey, what are the professionalism issues that I'm seeing? This is not a rule that we see see broken a lot of times. So that's a good thing because I think there's that caveat there of it has to be to the point that the four point four, uh, rule 4-8.3 uh, says there has to be that caveat. Are they going to the extreme that they're, you know, compromising their ability to practice law, that they're not trustworthy, they're not uh, able to practice law, okay? So it's not something that we see reported often. But to better answer that question, I can tell you that there are resources before you get to the point that this rule is violated. And that's what I think is really important. So moving forward slides on the screen, a couple of programs I really want to address to you. It's the Florida Lawyer Assistance Program, known um, as Law Inc. Law Inc. has been around forever. You've probably seen some form, some form or across we've done workshops or so forth. Law Inc. is based in South Florida in Fort Lauderdale specifically. Not part of the FAR. Um, we do provide funding in, in respects and grants and so forth from the Florida Bar. Flaw Inc. is an amazing organization. Attorneys in mental health professional substance abuse committed to serving attorneys. It is so, so good. I've done in the last few years a number of workshops with Inc. staff. They always just leave up feeling they're just such good people. They are based Florida, they serve our state. They all go into our law school. Uh, they do a wonderful job of posting on social media as well. So if you know one or you are struggling with substance issues specifically, they are phenomenal, phenomenal. Other mental health issues, but definitely substance abuse issues. Confidential, they are confidential, confidential, confidential. Some rare chances that occur. So that you know, records can be as a part of a discipline process, but those are extremely rare. And for the most part, your treatment or your getting help from Flaw Inc. will serve your faith. 
should something happen on the road. I promise you that. And a lot of times as part of the process, send flaw eek and help. We don't want to discipline attorneys. We just want to serve the public. We're, we're, our job is to professionalism and to protect the public. That is the mission of the bar if you look on the bar's website. So definitely take a look at their website. Take a look at their page or Twitter page whatever we're calling that for now, <laughs> because they are always doing amazing promoting that. Second, um, at the bottom, please write that number down and check with all of the attorneys in your office, judges you know, anyone is a member in standing of the Florida So, the bar was working on this member budget, actually moved to launching lawyers COVID hit resources. Um, this is an amazing thing. Every member of the bar is entitled. It is so, so cool. So this is the Florida Legal Helpline. If you have an issue, and by issue, I mean you're struggling balancing being a parent um, to two kids, or you're having your budgeting, or you're going to this, or, oh, you need to, or, hey, I need to help me kind of uh, craft together, right? Hey, do you, right? Anything can be anything. Or hey, I'm alcoholic. Or hey, I'm feeling pretty depressed, and I'm thinking of harming myself. Anything. Call this. Number. Call this. Number. Keep this number out your. You can put it in your email. That attorneys ask me that. Can I put it in my email signature. Yes. Any member entitled to. It is part of your benefits. What will it do? It will lead you to a center that is part of a organization that has been around for 20 years in Atlanta, Georgia. They are not affiliated with the Florida whatsoever. Those folks on that corner are trained professionals. They will tell you what you need and what you know programs you need to be part of. And then here is the thing. They will refer you to an expert of some sort. So somebody to help budgeting all the way to mental health to abuse in your area, okay? In your area, it will help you find a professional to serve you in your area. Guess what? You get up to free visits with that professional and the bar pays. The bar pays. I tell you, when we first program, the original contract was for three visits. They've up to five. That's per year. So let's say later in the year you decide to use it. The holidays become too much for you. I, I single mom here. Family is all, all passed away. The holidays are hard for me. Okay, I'm going to be vulnerable and tell you, and I probably this with you guys last year. I am I struggle with anxiety. I've been diagnosed with anxiety. I actually have been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. So I struggle with it. And I had a routine appointment. Doctor's visits for I, I kind of know the reason. I'm not sure something when I was a kid in an office visit. 